Well, as Buzz Aldrin, you know, the astronaut, descended from the, uh, down the ladder to become the second man to walk on the moon, he told Neil Armstrong that he would leave the door of the lunar module ajar. Looking back at Buzz, all, or Armstrong, who was already walking around, said, you know, that's a good idea. They didn't know if they'd be able to get back in. Now, they said it in a jocular way, but there was a lot of meaning behind it. You see, Neil Armstrong was the pilot of the LEM, and just a few hours before they went out and walked around, he had landed it not knowing that everything would be okay. He ignored warning lights, there were things blaring and sounds happening, and he used the last bit of fuel to fly over an unexpected boulder field because they knew if they landed in the boulder field, they might tip the limb over. His heart rate was recorded at 156 beats per minute as he was landing it. The abort button was flashing red, and he could have hit it, and probably, and everybody would have understood why, but he didn't do it. Most people can't handle that kind of stress. I know I can't, but he did. The audacity of these men is amazing, still. That was 50 years ago, just over 50 years ago, and it's still astounding. And the deeper you look into it, the more astounding it is. You know, most things, when you learn more details, you you know, become more comfortable with it and things aren't quite as frightening. This is not one of those. The more you know, the worse it is. And it turns out that Neil Armstrong was probably just the right person to be the first man on the moon. He was undeniably the best pilot in the world at the time. He was supremely prepared to do this job, but he was also calm and humble. And a thousand years from now, you know, when all of the celebrities and the important people that we think of today will be long forgotten, they'll remember his name because of what he did. He didn't draw attention to himself. He just needed to do what needed to be done, and he'll be remembered for it. At the end of the first century, about 50 to 60 years after Jesus, the Gospel of John that we just read was, was written, and it was a harrowing time. It was the time when the Romans were persecuting Christians, the churches felt under threat, and the divisions between the Jews and the Jewish converts and the Gentile and the Gentile converts was at a breaking point at this time. And when for them to look back 50 years to Jesus is similar to how we look back to the, the time that I'm talking about, the Apollo landings. It was so long ago, but still within living memory. We can still remember it. And it was a completely, it was a different culture, it was a different time. You know, people fought a little bit differently back then, but the intensity of what Jesus had done had not diminished over time. And in fact, if anything, what he was, what he had done, was truly sinking in. And we have a more intimate portrait of, of Jesus in John's Gospel than we do in the other three. We have a better idea of the way Jesus thought. Now, the John, Jesus in John is quite different, and you, people have wondered about that for a long time. Scholars have been fighting over this for, for centuries, and um, what ha that has resulted in is that most scholars have kind of looked at the Jesus of uh, John to be a little bit more mystical, a little bit more maybe uh, theoretical, uh, not as historically reliable as the other three, the Synoptic Gospels, as they're called. And, um, but, 
more recently, some scholars, and this is just in the last few years, have looked at John in a different way, particularly uh, Dr. Paul Anderson at George Fox University and other scholars have actually believed that this portrayal of Jesus and John may be a little bit more accurate, a little bit more of who Jesus was because of a couple reasons. One is the timing of events, which happens over three years, and the moving about of, the, of Jesus and the disciples is a lot more realistic. It's a lot more like a real story than you've seen in the other three Gospels. And the other thing is, is that Jesus is portrayed as a highly knowledgeable um, rabbi in these, in, in these stories. So you can see with the authority that Jesus speaks about the Torah in the Gospel of John. Now, like the astronauts then, Jesus was well prepared to carry out his mission as a rabbi. In fact, he was so prepared, it gave him standing to speak in the synagogues and travel from synagogue to synagogue to talk. Not just anybody could do this. You had to have been anointed to do this. But the people of the time were clamoring for a different kind of leader than Jesus. They wanted a zealot to throw the Romans out. Galilee at the time was filled with very religious people itching for a fight. They thought that the times called for a bully, a strong man, somebody who was going to use his authority to make change. But here is Jesus with all of his intellect and all of his religious authority, and he could have used that to raise an army but he refused to play along. It's really remarkable when you think about it, how audacious Jesus was. He was unique. And as John the Baptist cried out, he goes, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Not necessarily your sins or my sins. No, the sin of the world, the brokenness of the world. And with this, John anoints Jesus as the highest form of rabbi with God in spirit as a witness to become anointed for his mission. And it, for Jesus to do this around age 30 makes perfect sense in the rabbinic traditions. It's no accident that Jesus began his ministry around that time in his life. So if Jesus is no outsider, and he was a, then he was an insider who defied the authorities in a different way. Many of the Jewish leaders of the day, you see, had set aside their principles. They had thrown away what was right and good in order to attach themselves to political power, to Herod Antipas and to the Romans, to kind of save their own skins. And this is something that, you know, we've seen through history. It's very familiar to us. We've seen this. But instead, Jesus attaches himself to the weak and the poor. And he does this in open defiance of them. The Messiah is supposed to be a powerful king. But he turns that on its head. The audacity of Jesus makes him a target. Now, many people think that Jesus had a complete knowledge of what was happening to him. Now, I, don't, I recognize this might be challenging for some people here listening to this, but you might think that Jesus had a magical understanding or understood exactly what was going to happen to him. And sometimes you get that impression when you read John because it seems like Jesus is all knowledgeable. He certainly knew he was special, he certainly knew he was anointed to be the Son of God, but being the incarnate God as fully human, it's unlikely he really knew everything that was going to happen to him before it did. It's any more than you and I know our future. Because this is part of the incarnation. He was human like us, and he was humble before the Father. 
And that makes his audacity all the more astounding when you think about it. Why did he do what he did? So Jesus had something called mitzvah. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but that's what the Jews call their, his religious duty. He just had to do what he was called to do. There's probably not a lot of question in his mind. Now, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin weren't sure if they were going to come back from the lunar surface. Michael Collins, you remember him, he was the one that was in the command module that was orbiting the, uh, uh, the moon. He was waiting for them to come. Something that the public, however, didn't know at the time, but only found out much, much later, was that Collins actually had two sets of coordinates to get back home. One of those sets of coordinates was without the body weight and equipment of Armstrong and Aldrin. There was a chance he was going to come back alone. There was also, President Nixon at the time had an alternate speech available in case they were stuck. So, it's incredible when you think about it. They weren't foolhardy. They were strategic. They understood what they were getting into, and they were ultimately prepared. But they were incredibly brave. Jesus knew that his ministry would likely lead to his death because he knew who he was dealing with. But he felt he had no choice because he loved his people. Not because he was a troublemaker, not because he had secret knowledge, but because he knew how profoundly separated his people had become from God. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. It's he who brings God to us again. So I'd like for you to take a moment, just a moment, and consider what it means to empathize with Jesus. Too often we put Jesus apart and we say, give me something, support me, uh, listen to me. And that's all good. But sometimes it's good for us to think, what would it have been like to be him and to empathize with him, to have um, compassion for our, our Lord? Imagine being so influential in showing people how to be one with the Father, but then also imagine the disappointment and frustration when they don't get it when they're selfish and they fight amongst each other, which they certainly did. Imagine the uncertainty and the fear and the heartbreak when he realizes that he is a targeted man and that he will be crucified. So at the start of Ordinary Time today, we celebrate the launching of Jesus' ministry. And the ministry is to um, save humanity through nonviolence and love, not through power and violence. Isaiah tells us of one who cries out in the wilderness to usher in a new way, like John the Baptist crying in the wilderness. Do you ever feel like crying out when you see something so wrong that you need to cry out for justice? Do you know what it's like to say something that's so dangerous to the world? So align yourself with Jesus. Listen to Jesus, not to the religious zealots or the powerful of the day. The audacious Jesus who lifts up the weak, hangs out with the poor, who eats bread with sinners. Like Jesus, it's our mitzvah to tell the truth. It's our mitzvah to love the unlovable. It's our mitzvah to proclaim the real Jesus, the dangerous Jesus, to the world that needs to hear him. So in your prayers, and in your actions, and in your worship here, right now, proclaim, behold, the Lamb of God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we honor and praise your holy name. We know that you have called us to be your people in this messy world. 
Give us open and loving hearts to stand up for you and what's right, what's good, to be audacious and bold. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we celebrate the start of a new year of ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.